So folks, Brian here, and welcome back to the Mindful Homestead. Wait a minute. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Mindful Homestead. My name is Jack, and in case you didn't get it from the little intro there, we had a visitor on the homestead this week and we took a little bit of a road trip. Today we are on the road with our friend Brian from the Homestead Journey Podcast. And we're going to a charcuterie workshop. But before that, I just want to mention that if you are unaware, our poultry processing workshop is going to happen this weekend, Saturday, October 2nd. In it, I'm gonna be teaching you how to process these pastured Cornish cross chickens that you see behind me. We're gonna be going over everything, the actual slaughter process itself, to evisceration, to plucking, to breaking these birds down into parts. And at the end of the class, everyone's gonna go home with one chicken that they've processed themselves from start to finish. So if you're somewhere close to Southwestern New Hampshire and that interests you and you wanna participate, get a hold of us, leave a comment down below. Uh, reach out to us via Facebook, Instagram. We'll get you signed up for it. We still have a few spots available. It is 50 bucks per person, and that does include going home with one of the chickens that you see behind me for supper, uh, which is $25 that we normally charge for. So works out pretty well. Now I wanted to talk about what I did this past weekend. As you can tell by the intro, Brian, my good friend from the Homestead Journey podcast. I'm Brian, this is 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And we attended a two day charcuterie intensive that was hosted by Seth Wright at Timberhaven Farm and taught by Meredith Lee who is a super knowledgeable person who has, through her travels, gained a wealth of information and has made it available to those who participate in her, her classes and events. She's someone who I'm actually kind of ashamed to say that I was unfamiliar with prior to Brian mentioning that this event was happening. Brian came out Friday night after work all the way from beautiful upstate New York. We hung out that evening here at the house. We had great conversation. And then bright and early Saturday morning, we hit the road. So the course is split up into two days. You're starting the course with a pig that has been gutted in half. In this case, we started with a beautiful 95 pound hung weight uh, American guinea hog from Timberhaven Farm where we were having the course. First time working with American guinea hogs, really, really interesting pig, uh, great fat content, especially compared to the lean pigs that we raise. Not that we don't get great fat off our pigs, but the ratio of fat to meat was really kind of on point for making charcuterie as I learned later. And it, it's made me think about, do I wanna bring in another breed and, and raise some American guinea hogs for charcuterie purposes alongside the Berkshire Durox that we already raise. Day one starts with us learning to break down a hog in charcuterie cuts. The standard American way of breaking down a hog into your primal cuts, your loin, your shoulder, your butt, uh, your your belly that works for a lot of your traditional American cuts pork chops shoulder roasts things like that but when you're looking to do charcuterie with an animal you're more looking for whole muscles so you don't just want to hack the ham in half and cut steaks out of it you don't just want to blast through the shoulder to get your shoulder off from the loin you know you really want to take your time and go in there and, and gut out those whole muscles so you can have a whole copa so you can have a whole loin so that was what the very first part of the class was centered on was showing us how you would essentially bone out the center section of a hog and then handing it over to us and letting us kind of take the reins and, and try it for ourselves from there we got into learning how to make head cheese because we obviously had the head of the animal we did some talking about why charcuterie what are the purposes of it but really the nitty-gritty was actually getting into it and learning how to do stuff so head cheese is something i had heard a lot about but had never actually done i got to see the process there straight through from pulling the head off of the carcass to what seasonings you use how you go about cooking it how long you cook it what the process is like after that was all part of day one another huge part of day one was sausage making and for me this is one of the things that i really wanted to pull out of the course because I know the flavor profiles behind sausage. I know what goes good together. I know technically what makes a good sausage. But in terms of the bind on the sausage, the texture of the sausage, I've never really been able to get my fresh sausage to the point where I've really considered it great. Uh, it's been good in flavor, but the texture has always been a little bit off. And now it's raining, so I'm gonna go 
I'm gonna go open the garage door and hang out inside. Seeing the process of making sausage, uh, the, the dyes that you grind it through, the, the ways that you grind it and how many times you grind it and how you don't leave it all the same size, like not all the meat gets run through all the dyes. That was really helpful for me to, to take my sausage to the next level. But the sausage talk also involved going deep into different types of sausages that you would normally not think of. But you have your regular sausages, like your hot Italian, your sweet Italian, your county fair sausage, if you're familiar with those. But it also went into things like mortadella, which is an Italian, I always jokingly call it fancy bologna, but it, it's more of a suspension than it is a traditional sausage where you're emulsifying things together and, and you're getting a uniform consistency versus um, like a consistency in a fresh sausage where you'll have fat, meat, lots of other things in there. Another thing we talked about this day was the ratios and, and things to think of when you're making salamis. Because salami, if you think about it, it's a sausage that is going through a fermentation and then a cure process and a drying process. So something that, again, not a lot of people think of, but your ratios for salami are going to be different than a fresh sausage, which is which is really kind of eye-opening to, to hear talked about because you always you know it and you read it, but to see it in practice is something completely different. Lastly, on that first day, we also went over some other cool things. Uh, we ended up breaking up into three separate teams. Uh, one of us worked on a country pate, uh, which is a coarser, more kind of rustic type of pate. Another group of us, uh, myself included, we worked on an awful pate, O-F-F-A-L. Uh, originally it had started as a liver pate, uh, but unfortunately based on the size of the pig we had, we didn't have enough liver to just kind of rock it and do a straight liver pate. So we put in some heart, we put in some kidneys, and it became kind of an amalgamation of a different type of, you know, the 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 off cuts, if you will, that, that people often don't eat or throw away when they harvest their animals. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I put in, do you want the the kidneys? Do you want the liver? Do you want the heart? And the people that buy our pigs from us just don't want them. Charcuterie is a great way to take these these off cuts that so many people think of as just off putting, like they don't like the texture of heart or they don't like kidney or they don't like liver. And you can turn them into something where, you know, if you put a pate in front of somebody, that's going to be a lot more appetizing to them than just uh, putting a sliced up and, and grilled heart in front of them. So we wrapped up day one. Brian and I got on the road back to my place. It was an hour long drive and we had a little bit of an adventure. Brian, scenic route. Uh, thanks, man. I hear banjos playing already. We're, we're going to die up here in the middle of nowhere. I was going to say New Hampshire, but we're still no, in Massachusetts. No, this is Massachusetts. Right? The New Hampshire GPS is showing us the goods here in uh, Massachusetts. What happened was there was a road closure and it didn't really matter because we missed the turn anyway, but the GPS took us down some of North Central Massachusetts most, I guess you could say rustic byways. So Jack gave me crap about my GPS uh, taking us the, the long way. Well, this is my fault because we missed the turn that we were supposed to take. But look how great this is. This is beautiful. <laughs> Behold, the glorious Massachusetts splendor. Day two started bright and early. We got down there. We did some talking about our sausage homework recipes. The team that I was on, we ended up making a, a cool kind of hybrid of the sausage I came up with along with some ingredients from somebody else's sausage. Uh, they were looking at using goju chilies, which is Korean chili, typically used in gochuguru, which is a dried goju chili, or goju jang, which is that fermented chili paste that you see a lot in Korean cooking. Uh, we used those. We used green onions from their recipe as well. We used a little bit of kimchi brine that they had brought as an ingredient for their sausage, potentially. And we used something called amasaki, which is a derivative of koji. I'm still not fully 100% versed on this. We talk about koji later in the course but it's a product of koji fermentation used in a lot of Eastern spirit making uh, and food making now as well. And let me tell you, putting the things I learned the day before to actually use, it, it came out awesome. It was one of the best sausages that I've ever been a part of. The texture was spot on, the, the cook was spot on, the bind was spot on, the flavoring was spot on, everything just worked. And really this was the first inclination that like, 
holy crap, this is, I'm, I'm learning a lot here. I'm really moving to the next level. While two teams were making the sausages, a third team was working on that mortadella, keeping it going, keeping it cold. You need to keep it below 40 degrees at all times when you're making it. Otherwise the fat is gonna separate and you're just not gonna end up with a good finished product. We broke for lunch. Uh, we did cook up the sausages that we made, which were awesome. And then after lunch, we got into the talk of curing whole muscles. Uh, this is gonna be your copa. This is gonna be your bacon. You know, bacon counts as a whole muscle cure. Uh, this is your Lomo or your Lanzinos, which is your back loin. Going over these, I had had some experience with them in the past, so uh, I won't say I wasn't paying attention, but it was kind of a hash of a lot of things. I, I already had a, a pretty mediocre grasp on, if you will. I don't wanna say mediocre, knowledge. I mean, I, I've made whole muscle cures before and, and not gotten sick from them, which is pretty much the the judgment in that realm. But after we talked whole muscles, we talked more about the fermentation process of salami. Because while salami is a cured meat, it's also a fermented meat. Meaning that once you make your salami and you inoculate it with your good bacteria that you want, that's going to give it that flavor you need to essentially let that thing warm up in a high humidity environment for a couple days. And uh, for me, that's kind of a weird thing. You think drying meat, high humidity, warm, that's where you get a lot of your 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 bad stuff going on. And what the course kind of made me see was that you're, you're doing it for flavor. You're inoculating with good bacteria, which colonize and, and kind of outcrowd the bad bacteria that you're worried about. And then once you put it into your curing chamber to let it start drying over time, you're adjusting temperature and humidity, you're letting that good bacteria and good mold grow, and you are essentially creating a product that it, there's no opportunity for, for bad stuff to grow on it, which was really cool to see. After we finished up on salami, we talked about koji at pretty solid length. This is a rabbit hole that you can go down and people that have gone down get very passionate about it. But essentially koji is another form of microbe that comes to us from uh, Asia mostly. Um, Asian cultures use it a lot. Uh, this is the culture that's used in sake making, plum wine. And koji is really cool in that you can do a lot of things with it. It's an enzymatic process rather than a, a digestive process of, of bacteria. So you're now, it, you know, it's, it's fungal versus, versus bacteria. So you're now in this realm where, where things can get done really quickly, which was pretty cool to talk about. I don't know if I'm ready to jump down that rabbit hole yet, but it was nice to hear about it and know what people are talking about, at least when I, when I hear someone say, oh, this salami was done with Koji, um, to know what's going on there. Lastly, we split up into a couple groups again, and half of the group went and got the charcuterie spread ready, and the other half of the group split up actually all the things we had done over the course of the two days and everyone got to take that home. We had a large feast where we put out a lot of the pâtés, the riettes that we did, which I didn't even talk about in this video, but there's a whole riette confit discussion that occurred there. All of these things that we made, the ones that were ready to eat, we ate, uh, but the ones that were not ready to eat that needed a little bit more time, your salamis, your cured meats, those actually got sent home. And I brought home a whole salami uh, that I am, it's in the fridge right now and, and trying to stall it for a day or two. And then it's gonna go into a fermentation chamber that I'm actually gonna be probably getting set up tonight or tomorrow. I brought home some of the mortadella we made, which is probably the best I've ever had. I brought home some country pate and I brought home a whole bunch of pork skin that's gonna get put into, uh, it's gonna get made into pork rinds, obviously, cracklins, um, cause who doesn't love a good cracklin? But I'm gonna take a bunch of it as well and make it into gotika, which uh, not many people are familiar with, but it's essentially a rolled up and braised pork skin. You braise it in tomato sauce over the course of an entire day. You start your sauce in the morning and you just cook it and cook it and cook it. And that skin turns into the most delicious, gelatinous, texturally satisfying food I think I've ever eaten personally. It's one of my favorites. I remember it growing up as a child. Uh, it was something that my family ate. Another nice thing is that you go home with copies of both of Meredith's books. Uh, this is pure charcuterie. Uh, it's very targeted in terms of technique. And then this is Ethical Meat Handbook. Uh, this is both um, kind of a, a, a lesson, if you will. It, it teaches you a lot of stuff. Uh, what is ethical meat? Where does it come from? How can we be more active in that process? Uh, but it's also got a bunch of good recipes in here as well. So what are my thoughts on this whole thing after taking a charcuterie intensive like this? 
I feel like it's really important to acknowledge the fact that this is information that, you know, you could put it in a book, you can see it on the internet, and until you actually do it, and there's somebody there who knows what they're doing and can show you and guide you along the path, uh, that information is really kind of hard to, to, to wrap your fingers around and really grasp well. You know, pates and mortadella and, and things like that, they're all, they're all projects that I've looked at and, and got an idea about like oh i'd like to do that one day but they either seemed like too big like i know how hard it is to make an emulsification for for hot dogs and mortadella or i i thought i knew how hard it was but now seeing it done and realizing that there's a few key steps there that make the process go a lot smoother and and better for you in the end um it's really kind of empowered me to, to take that step forward same thing with the uh, with the organs of the animals, you know, I've, I've got kidneys in the freezer. I've got livers in the freezer. I've got pork heart in the freezer. I've got tons of it. And these are things that while I knew you could do it, I didn't really, I wasn't able to wrap my head around the steps to make, to make it happen. Uh, Meredith's course in particular, her, her knowledge is deep. I mean, anything we brought up, you know, like, Oh, I wonder if you could do it this way she would know, oh, there's a region in Spain where they do that, and it's called this, and this is how they do it, and this is what makes it work there. And and her, her knowledge is so vast that simply sitting and hearing her talk for two days would have been more than enough to, to justify the cost of the course in my head. And uh, getting actually to put hands on and participate in it and bring stuff home, bring home these projects um, that I know have a solid start and I just need to finish them out. That is totally worth the, worth the price of admission, both literally and figuratively. So big thanks to Meredith Lee for putting this on. You can check her out. I'll put a link in the description down below, uh, but her website is mareleefood.com. Uh, also big thanks to Seth over at Timberhaven Farm. You can find him at timberhavenfarm.com. Everyone, you know, it was a great event that was put on and, and I can't say enough good about it. And how important it is to to make sure that you're learning these things and and you know using your animals to their fullest. It, it's not just about creating good food for us, but it's about doing justice by the animal and making sure that that animal is respected and and utilized completely, even after it's it's sacrificed for us. Thanks for watching, everybody. I know a little bit different video than we've done in the past, but after taking this course, I did just want to throw it out there and let people know that there are resources like this out there educationally that you can utilize to to get the most out of whether you're raising your own animals or whether you're purchasing an animal from your from a farmer like myself these resources are there for you to to participate more actively in the process of raising and utilizing an, an animal versus just you know handing over a check and, and getting your pork chops and putting them on the grill as always, I appreciate each and every one of our subscribers out there. Thanks for watching and have a great day.